This video has been sponsored by Mubi. Mubi is an amazing online video streaming service that brings you incredible films from all over the world. Each day there's a new film, but each film is only hosted for 30 days. That means that there's an ever-changing catalogue of hand-picked films to suit anybody's taste. And you can watch them right now on your laptop, or take them on the go with a mobile device. Right now, you can get a 30-day free trial by heading over to movie.com slash 100 years. By the mid-1940s, cinema was already a well-established medium. Audiences had seen the advent of sound, Colour had burst its way onto the screen. We'd seen monsters and heroes, epic adventures and intimate romances. But even in the most well-developed of medium, there's still room for a film to come along and change everything. And in 1945, that film was Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City, and it was born of the war-torn ruins of post-World War II Italy. Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. Martin Scorsese once called Italian neorealism the most precious moment in film history. And it's easy to see why. These are films that focused on life as it was, exploring the humanity and everyday goings on of people in difficult situations. They didn't focus on courageous heroes or the glamorous lives of a wealthy elite. These weren't films of Hollywood escapism. They were a spotlight on the lives of the poor, desperate and downtrodden. Rome Open City is heralded as one of the most influential films ever made. And while it wasn't the first neorealist film, it kick-started the Italian neorealist movement, invigorated post-war cinema all over the globe, and brought Italy into its golden age of filmmaking. But to really understand the impact of Italian neorealism, we need to take a look at the kind of films that came out in Italy before the war. Going back to the earliest days of cinema, Italy was responsible for some of the most groundbreaking films, from one of the first blockbuster epics like Kibera to experimental avant-garde futurist films like Ties. From the beginning, Italian filmmaking was a globally dominating force, but by the end of the First World War, Italy's film industry had begun to face some problems. Desperately needed funds were being diverted to the war effort, and it faced serious competition from industries in both Europe and America. Despite its huge beginnings, Italy's film industry would be practically non-existent until the rise of fascism and Benito Mussolini in 1922. Like most fascist and totalitarian states, the government of Mussolini sought to control the film industry as a means of propaganda and pacification. By the 1930s, Mussolini established one of the largest film studios in all of Europe, complete with the slogan, cinema is the most powerful weapon. The films produced under Mussolini's rule weren't explicitly fascist in tone, but they were built on extreme patriotism and nationalism, and they were used by Mussolini to reflect a vision of Italy that he saw fit. Although the country produced many different genres at the time, by far the most popular were the Telefoni Bianchi, or the White Telephone. These were essentially copies of Hollywood comedies at the time, focusing on glamour and the lives of the wealthy. They reinforced traditional family values, a subservience to authority, and the upholding of the status quo. Importantly, these films were forbidden from examining the social problems facing Italy. Instead of giving the audience a view of the world around them, it gave them an idealised image of what a supposed life in a fascist state could be. At a time of unspeakable horror and war, the white telephone films helped to pacify a poor and war-torn population. The name of the movement came from the frequent use of telephones as props, a symbol of luxury unimaginable to most Italians. Here's how director Carlo Rizzani described the movement. It seems unbelievable that at a time of worldwide suffering, there was such a proliferation of films as non-existent, as empty, and as alien to the national identity as our commercial films of these years. They were full of gesticulating, soulless shadows, speaking a language which would be quite incomprehensible today. It was in opposition to these soulless shadows that Italian neorealism emerged. As with all film movements, it's hard to pin down a specific origin, but most argue that neorealism can be traced back to Lucino Visconti's 1943 film Obsession. The adaptation of James N. Kane's The Postman Always Rings Twice wasn't truly neorealist. 
but it preceded the movement in its dark and gritty tones and its realistic portrayal of a poorer working class. Its bleak worldview was so unprecedented and controversial that at the film's premiere, Mussolini's son, a film critic called Vittorio, cried, this is not Italy, before storming out of the theatre. The film was subsequently banned and all copies, bar one, were destroyed. Later that year, the situation in Italy deteriorated. The Allies landed in Sicily, Rome was heavily bombed for the first time in the war and the fascist government of Mussolini fell and was replaced with a Nazi puppet government, the Italian Socialist Republic. The occupation of Italy saw many Italians living in extreme poverty, hunger and deprivation. Needless to say, Italy's film industry slowed to a trickle and almost ceased entirely. But there were still a few filmmakers in the country dedicated to their craft and they carried with them the same desire to show Italy as it really was as laid out in Visconti's obsession. Far from the glossy world presented by the white telephone films, they wanted to examine the lives of real Italians, to use the camera as a tool for examining the real Italy. In 1944, Roberto Rossellini started production of Rome Open City, and it would mark the true beginning of Italian neorealism. But with Italy's film industry essentially destroyed, it was almost impossible for the filmmaker to gain access to even the most basic filmmaking equipment. To add to this difficulty, the city of Rome itself was almost in ruins. It was in the solution to these challenges, the innovations required to make a film in such a desolate environment that gave neorealism its distinctive characteristics. To get the film made, Rossellini took to buying film on the black market, piecing together different types of film stock to make reels. The varying image quality combined with handheld shots lends a feeling of authenticity and documentary style, as if the events captured really happened. The opening shots of the film show us German soldiers patrolling war-torn streets, singing marching songs, presenting the film as almost more of a historical document of life in Rome than a work of fiction. With limited resources, the film was produced using whatever was available at the time, and one of the things shared by all Romans was Rome. For Rosolini, the city itself became a studio. Shooting on location just two months after the end of occupation meant that the locations themselves told a story. Dirty hallways and ruined buildings tell the tale of the poverty inflicted on these people. Rubble in the streets echo the horrors of war that sounded just a few months before. While it is true that some scenes were shot in studios, location shooting would become an integral part of future neorealist films, lending it a sense of veritacity. This effect was only intensified by the use of locals and unknown actors. Rosalini did use two big name actors in Aldo Fabrizi and Anna Magnani, but the rest of the cast was made up with unknown actors and locals from around the town. Gone were the glamorous starlets of the white telephone films, and in its place were the rugged survivors of a real war. People who had lived through the same horror that they were now depicting. Rosalini played loose with the script, allowing his actors to improvise their scenes where they saw fit, leading to a much more naturalistic tone that had come out in Italy or Hollywood before. The realism served as a counterpoint to moments of high drama, a woman being gunned down in the street, a resistance leader being tortured, a priest asking God to forgive his executioners. These moments are made more impactful because of the starkness and the reality of the film that surrounds them. They reflect the real events that happened in Rome just one year before. All of these elements add up to what would become the basis for Italian neorealism, a style that would indelibly change the landscape of cinema. Some argue that the true origin of neorealism lies with Rossellini's follow-up film, Paisa, which lent much deeper into the aesthetic of neorealism, doing away with all sets and known actors. But as Rossellini said, his films were born from a tremendous need for truth, and were about maintaining a moral position more than a style. To boil them down to just a style or an aesthetic does something of a disservice. They amount to more than just handheld shots of unknown actors, more than just fictional stories taking place in real locations. These were films designed to cut through the soulless shadows and to use cinema as a magnifier of truth. The immediate legacy of Rome Open City is obvious. The incredible films that came out of Italy in its wake amount to some of the greatest films ever made. 
and they all try to show us the real world through different perspectives. Children in shoeshine, parents in bicycle thieves, and the elderly in Umberto D. By the mid-1950s, Italian neorealism began to fall out of favour. As life in Italy became less and less difficult, the need for these kind of films dried up, and audiences looked elsewhere for their entertainment. But that's not to say that Italian neorealism died out. Its influence can be felt in films like Kez and mumblecore films like Funny Ha Ha. Even a film like Moonlight, though much more stylized and clean looking than any of the Italian neorealist films, carries with it the same moral position, the same need for truth as Rossellini's films. Italian neorealism may have come and gone, but its legacy left us with a question. What is cinema for? Some films are made just to entertain, some make grand political or philosophical statements, but what Rossellini proved is that the cinema can be about us. All of us, the world we inhabit, and how it affects us. Italian neorealism ran from the early 40s with films like Obsession and Roma with the City, and wound down with Umberto D and Journey to Italy in the mid-1950s. But you can see its fingerprints all over the screen, in films that are trying to cut through the soulless shadows and show you the world as it truly is. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema, my name's Charlie. If you're new to Italian neorealism, the three films you should check out are Rome Open City, The Bicycle Thieves, and Shoeshine. First of all, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon, particularly Karin Bensinger. Thank you all so much for supporting this project, it really helps me in getting the resources I need to keep this channel going. I also want to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is an incredible streaming site that brings you some of the best films from around the world. They bring you a new film every day so there's always something interesting to watch. It's a great place to discover new and interesting films and they do a great job of shining a light on spectacular cinema that otherwise might find it hard to land a wider audience. Head over to Mubi.com slash 100 years to get yourself a 30 day free trial. Check out more of my videos on the screen now, subscribe, and click the Patreon button to help support this channel. Thanks for watching, I'll be back next time with a film from 1946.